Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global community. My name is John Farrar. I'm the CEO of Nimble. And today is an amazing day, uh, not only because it's one of the first days of spring as uh, the world emerges from this unusual year, but, uh, but I get to spend a morning with my dear friend, Mark Schaefer. Mark, say hello. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Mark, what I love about you is, is you're a human being who loves humans and, uh, and, and you're here to help them grow. And I think that's how you grow in life. And, uh, and I, and I really dig that about you. Uh, for those that don't know about Mark, Mark has been a teacher and a preacher, uh, in and around more than just marketing, but certainly a solid foundation in marketing. Um, is there something wrong with the press, the screen or the audio? No, no, no. I just like that. Preacher okay. and a teacher. <laughs> uh, and um and and I think that you write books because you've got this thing in you that you channel the universe. You channel vibrations and ideas. And I think that uh you get those ideas uh as a accumulation of other ideas and then you build on them to build net new ideas and the reason why that resonates with me is because I do something not dissimilar. And I and I love that you're able to do it on all the amazing platforms that you do, but I especially love your books uh, because they're digestible and uh, and they impact people. And the thing that you said to me today where you said that somebody came in to you and said they changed their life, I live for that. I, I live for that on a daily basis. So uh, could use ma'am. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is John Ferrara. I've been building tools to help people build relationships all my life. I, I do it because I struggle to manage relationships at scale. And, uh, and it turned out that millions of other people do as well. So if you're here because you value relationships with others in building a sustainable garden of people around you to achieve your dreams in life, uh, you you come to the right place. Uh, and with that, uh, here is the agenda. Uh, we're going to be talking about Mark's new book, Cumulative Advantage. I'm not going to read the agenda because I think Mark's going to uh, be able to deliver these concepts much better than I. Uh, Mark, why don't you go ahead and grab the screen? If you can't grab the screen, uh, Michaela, if you could hand it to him. And in the meantime, I want to ask everybody to ask questions throughout this presentation because it's through questions that we learn and grow. And we're going to be compiling those questions in the background. Uh, during the presentation. And um, so uh, with that, Mark, take us away. I'll be talking a little bit about my new book today, Cumulative Advantage. And I'm gonna do something different today. You know, I've got sort of a regular speech that I'm out there giving uh, about the book, but today I thought I would do something different. So people now uh, are, are have read the book. It's been out for a few weeks now, and they're coming to me with like, wow, this was amazing. Wow, this changed my idea about things. So what I thought I would do today is talk about some of those wows. So it's not necessarily what I think is important about the book, it's what other people are telling me that really kind of stopped them in their tracks. The, I mean, the main, I, I read a book, as John said, when I see a problem that I when, that I don't understand, and the fundamental idea behind cumulative advantage is that I've been teaching social media and content marketing for I think 13 years at the university level, and what I what I'm seeing now from the people that I work with and my clients and my students is that people are working so hard and they're doing great work, and there's so much content out there so much competition that even if you're great you're being buried how do you stand out in this kind of a world in fact here is the the only question we struggle with in marketing today in fact i'm going to save you so much time and so much money this is the 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 question that's in every marketing book that's been written in the last 10 years and the theme of every marketing book that's going to be written in the next 10 years. How can we be heard? 
if you're reading about social media or SEO or content or whatever, how can we be heard in this noisy, noisy world? And I'm not the kind of person to say, oh, well, you know, competition, too bad. It's getting harder. Let's just, you know, roll over, take a nap and, you know, figure it out. I get obsessed with trying to figure out what is next. And that's why I, I wrote this book. Uh, cumulative advantage to really talk about how can we build momentum. This book is about building momentum. And as you'll see in this book, I go down some pretty deep rabbit holes, starting with research that started in the 1960s and apply it to our lives and our businesses today. So as I said, I plucked out five big ideas and I thought it would be interesting to have a conversation with John about these different ideas because John and I think uh, so much alike. Now, here's sort of a summary of the pattern of the book. And what I, what I found is that there are more or less five things that happen that build momentum. All momentum starts with some initial advantage. And I'll talk about what that is in a minute. A seam is an opportunity. So if you have an idea and you pursue an idea, timing, the, the space and the speed and the time of the world, that makes a difference as to whether your idea is going to fly or not. Once you found a reasonable opportunity, you need to create awareness. We're not going to talk about this too much today, but there's a, ch a couple chapters in the book talking about new ideas that are really doable and accessible to anyone about creating awareness for your idea, your business, your brand in a big way. We're gonna to talk today a little bit about reaching out, reaching up, and then once you have this momentum, you have to make good decisions, surround yourself with the right resources, Nimble would be one of those, to keep the momentum going. All right, so John, if you're ready, here is big idea number one. The start of momentum is nearly always random. Now, this part of the book is inspired by research that was done uh, by a well-known author named Franz Johansson, and he did very compelling work to show how almost every successful person and almost every successful business started with some random event. So I'm going to tell you my random event that I can draw a line from one conversation in the early 1990s to me being with you today. In the early 1990s, I was more or less stuck in my marketing job. Uh, my boss wasn't going anywhere. I was working for a Fortune 100 company. I was looking around, what do I do next? And this thing called the World Wide Web was beginning. And I had some ideas of how about, how about there could be real business opportunities on the web, a radical idea at the time. I went to my boss and I said, I would like your permission to get an AOL account and put it on my expense account. After much debate, because he thought it was a waste of money, he agreed. I was the first person at this Fortune 100 company to have an internet account. And I had some ideas and they worked. So I, it wasn't that I just had an idea. I pursued my idea and the timing was right. A few years later, this company wakes up and says, we need to have a global e-business department. Who shall we get to run it? Oh, Mark, you've been on the internet longer than anybody else. You've had these good ideas. It's you. And that's what really started things going for me. Eventually, I started my own business. And I could say, that's why I'm here with you today. It started with that random moment. Now, John, you had an interesting random moment that sort of launched your career, too. I did, Mark, and uh, and I really do believe in serendipity. Um, so I was uh, living in Los Angeles, and my mom, when I went and visited her, she didn't have custody. I grew up with my dad. My mom, uh, I went and visited her on the weekend in Newport Beach, and uh, and that Sunday we got on an airplane and we flew to New York. My first time on an airplane, and uh, she kind of stole us, like she, she stole us away to New York, and I lived there for a year. And during my journey in New York, which was really amazing, I walked into the Pan Am building 
and uh, it uh, in the in the lobby was a IBM Selectric teletype terminal. So back in the day, there weren't no cath there weren't any cathode ray tubes. It was basically a keyboard with paper that would roll through, and that was the terminal. And so uh, they let you touch it. So I went out there and I uh, I touched it, and it basically said hello. And I said I typed back hello and hit enter. And it said, tell me your name. I said, well, my name is John. And it said, well, how's your day going? And this this program was called Eliza. It was an AI program. And I was just so fascinated that this computer had a semi personality and I could actually interact with it. That uh, I was nine years old, I became enamored with computers. Uh, and nine years later, I bought the first computer that uh, that was ever really made for the masses, the Apple IIe. And it was because of purchasing that computer that shifted my life where I went and studied computer science. And then I had a, a job at a startup in Boston where they put me in sales and I started trying to manage my sales contacts and processes. I couldn't, couldn't do it effectively manually. And because I had a computer science background and I knew every software program in the market, I knew there wasn't a program to manage uh, sales and market automation and uh, email contacts and calendar. So I invented something called Goldmine. And I wouldn't have done any of that had my mom not stolen me away and I not touched that computer in the Pan Am building that morning. Random. Yeah, and I think this, I mean, and we see this pattern repeated over and over in the world. Why is Bill Gates Bill Gates? It's because when he was a teenager, he had access to some of the first prototypes of computers in the world. He was coding before anybody else. One of my favorite stories from the Cumulative Advantage book is about this uh, track coach. You know, back in the day, if you were a high school track athlete, you literally had metal spikes on the bottom of your shoes. You know, metal spikes in teenagers, probably a toxic combination. And this track coach thought there's got to be a better way. One day he's sitting in his kitchen. He's watching his wife make waffles. And he, she peels this waffle out of the waffle iron. Without saying a word, he runs back to the high school chemistry lab, gets some latex, pours it in the waffle iron, peels it out and say, says, this could be the bottom of a shoe. That's how Nike got started. And that rusty old waffle iron is on display at Nike headquarters like a museum piece. Now, why is this important? Because momentum begins with these random sparks almost always. So th this is significant because you don't need a PhD to create momentum for yourself. You don't need a million dollars in the bank. You just need to be aware of these opportunities that are bombarding you every day. Now, Mark, I, I can, yeah. can we go back to that for one second? No. I think that it's important that you listen to your life and listen yeah. for uh, not just the random events, but the random events that resonate over time and things keep coming back to them. And I think that if you look at, say my example of the computer, that random event touched on computer and really being excited about it and then buying a computer and then studying computers and then working in a computer store and then working for a startup, all of these things was a consistent theme. So I think if you listen, for the things that really push you and spark you, and then what keep resonating, coming back to that, those are your things that you want to focus on. Do you have a secret for that, like a an idea? Well, yes, yeah, I mean, there's there's actually a whole section in the book about that, and it's it's you have to really assess your idea in terms of how does it fit with your view of your life. Mm. And, and like I've turned down lots of opportunities in my life. I've left money on the table all the time because it just didn't fit my view of where I wanted to be in the world, of, of what I wanted to do with my family, of what, you know, the impact I wanted to make in the world. So it, it, you have to look at it not just really as the, as the view of is it a good idea, the first business I ever started, it was a really successful business. I decided I hated it. <laughs> I was I was doing great. I was making great money and my idea worked. But once I got into it, 
I realized I hated it and I needed to start something else. So I think that that view of lifestyle is super important. So now, and this, this idea sort of blends with this. Now, last March, March of 2020, I made a prediction. I said, there are going to be more business startups in the next six months than at any time in American history. Now, that was a really crazy project prediction. We were just beginning a pandemic. People were in crisis. Business was, were shutting down. Fear was gripping our entire country. The airlines were shutting down. Hotels and restaurants were shutting down. And here I'm saying, we are gonna see more startups than any time in our history. And that came true. We've had lots of business failures. It's been a very sad time, but we've had more startups than failures since the pandemic started. Why? Because there's been a fracture in the status quo. There's been a shift. There are new unmet or underserved customer needs. Millions and millions of new opportunities. People need to learn a different way. They need to shop a different way. They need to bank a different way. They need to relate in different ways. They need to exercise in different ways. And so there's a fracture in the status quo. And, and it doesn't take a pandemic for this to happen. There are shifts and changes, little micro fractures happening all the time. And the real uh, um, magic happens is like when you have this initial advantage, you have this initial spark, and then it fits with some unmet market need. Now, one of the things I do as I walk through in the book, different ways to assess that, because you need to, as best you can, figure out before you put too much work in everything, is this going to have a chance? So in my story, I had this idea of how there could be business applications on the internet. Well, the internet was exploding. And the, and the fracture in the status quo for me was, my company was far behind. They were clueless. So I took the initiative and I burst through what I call in the book, the seam, right? Strategy today is not a 50 page document and a five year plan. When I was growing up in business, yes, that's what strategy was. What strategy is today, is you see a fracture in the status quo and you go through that seam as hard as you can, as long as you can, as fast as you can and, and create as much opportunity with the time that, that you have. Any ideas on that, John, from your perspective? 100%, uh, change is opportunity. And I think that the fracture in the status quo that really shifted me on the momentum changes in my life happened with that adoption of the microcomputer. If you think about when the microcomputer was first introduced, there were no PCs on desktops. There are terminals on desktops and IT controlled the, the, the applications that people used. And it was the introduction of the PC that freed people up to be able to use technology as they saw fit. In fact, I sold Apple IIe's to uh, Rocketdyne uh, rocket engineers who used VisiCalc to design the engines because they couldn't get the IT people to code the programs to do the designs. And so the fracture that really shifted me on my way was first the introduction of the microcomputer, but then the introduction of networks that tied microcomputers together that enabled you to write network business applications to take advantage of those things. And then notebooks that enabled people to travel remotely with the data. And then the ability to connect these PCs through dial-up basically created a distributed set of machines across a company and I layered software on top that enabled people to manage contact collectively as a team across the entire company and all that because of the fracture of the status quo of the microcomputer networks and, um, and notebooks. Yeah, so fun fact, Bloomberg keeps a list of the 100 richest people in the world. Of those 100 people, there were 10 
who really did not have any sort of initial advantage, meaning they 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 were they grew up in poverty and they didn't even have a college education. But all, so here we have 10 people, mega, mega billionaires who started with nothing. All 10 of them did the same thing. It's exactly what we're talking about. They took an idea and seeing a trend, a shift in the world and bursting through that shift, through that trend, through that fracture with all force, all their energy and just going, going, going. And that's what took them to where they are today. So. Next big idea is, I think one of the most powerful things that impacted me as I was working on this book, and I'm writing a book is a wonderful experience because it's almost like getting a new master's degree. I study and I research and I write for two years, just like a master's degree. And at the end of that two years, I've learned so much and I've become uh, uh, you know, I hesitate to call myself an expert, but I'm at least educated in something new. And one of the things that had such an impact on me is this idea of mentorship. Now, mentorship, the traditional view of mentorship, I believe is out of date. The, 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 the classical definition is a, a mentor is a long-term relationship where someone in this position of power teaches you something new. If you need to learn something new today, you just need to go to YouTube, right? That's how we all learn today. You don't need a long-term relationship and a mentor to learn something new. But here's what a mentor does. It doesn't have to be all the time. It doesn't have to be a long-term relationship, but this is, a, is someone that can somehow lift you into a new level of momentum. If you're feeling stuck, they can make an introduction. They can give you encouragement. They can open up a new door of opportunity. And that is, in my mind, is the power, the true power of momentum and relation and mentoring today. It's not about teaching. It's about creating, helping people create initial sparks that lead to new momentum. Let me give you a quick example. I was in Clubhouse the other day, uh, which is a whole nother story about momentum, right? And this uh, man you know, raised his hand. He wanted to come on the stage and speak. And he said, Mark, I just wanted to say hello to you and thank you. Many years ago, I was in college and you were a guest lecturer in our college class. Now, I was an older student. I went back to school and I was disheartened. I wasn't even sure I was going to finish my degree. But after class, you stayed and answered all these questions that I had. And when that was over, you looked at me and you said, wow, you asked so many great questions. I can see you have really got something here. I can see your interest and passion in, in marketing you are really going to go far. He said, you know, Mark, nobody had ever said that to me before. And in that moment, I decided to stay in school. I was going to get a degree in marketing and now I've got an amazing marketing job. I'm able to feed my family. And it was because of that spark you created in me at that time. That wasn't a long-term uh, relationship, but that was a, a way that momentum was created through uh, to him through another person. And John, I'm sure you've had lots of opportunities in your life. Who is who is someone that might have helped you move to some new level of momentum? Well, I've got a couple of stories for you. One is this random event that happened when I worked at a large company called Hughes uh, Space and Communications and Hughes Missile Systems. It was part of Howard Hughes conglomerate. Sure. And there was this old guy that worked in the complex. There's 15,000 people on this plant site. And I was in the uh, admin department in IT. So I'd go around the whole plant site and how people with their computers and stuff. 
And this guy was a friend of my uncle, John, who was a head of IEEE back in the day. And he had been there for like 30 years at Hughes. And he used to tell me stories. I should have, could have, would have. I said, should have, could have, would have what? And he says, I should have, could have, would have started TRW or Lytton because these are all peers of here, his at Hughes because Hughes was the hotbed of aerospace technology back in the day and it sprouted all these other companies. And he said, I should have, could have, would have. And so uh, years later, when I was working at my next company, Banyan, and I came up with this idea of building network business software for managing relationships, I said to myself, you know what, even though I'm making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year and I got this great job, I can always go get a job because I, I, my knowledge, my capabilities, but I can't always go start something like this. And I don't want to say shoulda, coulda, woulda. So I started that company, Goldmine, but then I'm in an apartment in Los Angeles with the world's first contact manager for networks or CRM, but people don't even know they need network business software, let alone CRM. So how do you sell people something they don't need and I don't even have money to market, let alone I don't even know how to advertise. So I basically figured out that if I could access the trusted advisor of my prospect, the technology reseller who sold them the network, I can get that network reseller to recommend Goldmine to those customers. So I basically started building relationships with the trusted advisor of my prospect. And through that human connection with those resellers, they then enabled me to scale Goldmine to $100,000 a month without spending any money on marketing. This was all through human connections that enabled wow. me to achieve my dreams. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, and what one of the, th if I look at my career, this is one of the things I have not done a good job at. I am not a natural networker, and I sort of grew up in this world where I needed to be self-reliant, and so I, it, it's not easy for me to, seek mentors or ask for help but today i have what i would call like a board of directors there's a group of people who are they don't even even know it maybe but they're my advisors and uh one is uh the the ceo of a of a startup one is the founder of a very successful agency uh in new york one is the cmo of a fortune 100 company and when I have an idea for a book or I have an idea for my business and I need some input, I'll call on these people to give me some guidance and maybe help me create this opportunity. So it's not necessarily a formal thing. The other important part of what I have in this book is a, is a very specific process to identify and connect to the right people who can help create momentum for you in your life. Now, this idea right here, reinvent your narrative to unleash your momentum. This is not a major part of my book, but this, this narrative, this idea that I have in this book has had a profound impact on people. And this is what it's about. As I was doing research for this book, I came across these studies that show uh, a leading self-limiting factor are the stories in your life that are told about you. So, for example, the stories in my family that are told about me, the stories in my relationships. Now, and, and the stories, even with my customers, even in my social media audience, these stories, it's like, okay, how much am I conforming to these stories? Is that a good thing? Am I conforming to this narrative? Or is this like, wait a minute, this has always been told about me. That's, that's not really me. I did this coaching session. I do individual coaching a lot. And uh, there was a woman, her dream was to write a book. But she had this humiliating experience in high school. She failed English and she hated the teacher. And so the story in her family is this, this woman, she's a terrible writer. She could never write. She failed English in high school. Now, now she's a grown woman. She has a dream to write a book. She has lots of good ideas. She's very articulate. 
And today, it doesn't even really matter if you're a good writer. You can get help with that, starting with technology like Grammarly. And so we had to help her sort of explode this narrative that she had about herself and to unleash this whole new possibility of momentum. And I actually had to do that about myself. Like, what are, what are things that middle-aged white guys are supposed to talk about? That's a narrative. And I had to question some of that as I wrote this book. Because as you, when you read Cumulative Advantage, you'll find out there's things in that book that normally a middle-aged white guy wouldn't talk about. And I had to, like, reframe who I am because I had to talk about these things. I'm passionate about these things. My heart was bursting with these ideas. And if I didn't say them and write about them, I would have been a coward. I had to do it. And to do that, I had to reframe my narrative. Is, it, is anything like that ever happened to you, John? Yeah, Mark. I, I, I have uh, a number of narratives that I've sort of grown up with, starting with um, no one in my family has ever graduated from college. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I grew up in a in a modest house, uh, and we moved to even more modest house uh, when my father ran into some uh, entrepreneurial difficulty. And uh, I used to live in a town called Pacoima, and Pacoima is not uh, it's it's a notch below sort of middle class uh, in the east side of the valley, and uh, and I struggled with the narratives that were told me uh, told to me around my life, and in fact. When I was in high school, my senior year, I had to go to community college to take one more class just to get my high school diploma. So it wasn't that I was this shining uh, star academically or that I had clear direction in my life. But uh, buying that computer that summer in 1978 uh, shifted my life. And I went on to go to community college uh, to do what I needed to do to get into university and I got into the university and through all the uh, college work, I got straight A's and I shifted my narrative and my velocity in life where I was really a have not. And I became um, somebody that was just blessed with riches and opportunity. And I think it was really all due to the concepts you're teaching in this book right now. Yeah. What that is a beautiful story. That is really a beautiful, beautiful story. So again, um, this was something that I had in the book. Um, it's not a major part of the book, but so many people have told me, "Oh, Mark, when I read that section, it, it just something it exploded in my mind that made me think about my stories and my narratives, and I came to a realization that my momentum." Is, is I'm not reaching my full potential because I'm sort of conforming to these stories. Now, the last part of the book, uh, chapter 10 in the book, uh, whenever you get to this chapter, you're gonna be in for a big surprise. <laughs> yeah. It took me three months to write the last part of the book, uh, the last chapter of the book, because it was so difficult for me to struggle really with my narrative and what kind of book people expect me to write. And I had this realization that um, this book, it's, it's, it's as close to a self-help book as I've ever come to. Uh, this is my ninth book. And all my books have been really, really helpful and valuable. And I'm so grateful for all the people who love them. But this book, it, it, it really gets a little bit deeper into uh, psychology and patterns of behavior and how do you create momentum in your life. And here's what I realized. Every self-help book is elitist because it assumes you have the money to buy the book. It assumes you have the time to read the book or you even have the skills to read the book. It assumes you have time and resources to activate what you learn from the book. And all of us in our world are 
surfing the crest of a wave that started a long time ago. I gave you my story. John gave you his story about, look, I, I, I had this moment in, when I was at this company that just built the momentum, just built and built and built and built and built. And here I am, a consultant and a speaker and an educator and an author about digital marketing. And it happened, really, it started in that moment. And here's John, one of the greatest tech entrepreneurs of our of our of our generation and he was inspired as a little boy by a, tech, a computer that talked back to him right so we're all surfing the wave of 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 momentum that started a long time ago and some of us are surfing bill gates waves they're they're titanic and they're powerful right and some of us are surfing blue collar waves john came from a humble background he said today i came from a blue collar black background my i came from a a family of of plumbers so our wave we got to work a little harder to build that momentum and there's some people in our society that aren't surfing a wave at all they're being pulled under by the undertow and so i struggled what does momentum mean how do we build momentum for people in our society that are being pulled down. I talked a little earlier about the power of reaching up and reaching out for that opportunity, for that encouragement, for that spark, for that new introduction to someone that can build momentum. There's also power in reaching down and creating that encouragement, creating that spark for others. So the last part of the book is, is this idea that we can be momentum machines for others and john i know this is the way you live your life i know this is a core part of your philosophy you're one of the most generous people that i know so i'm sure this is going to be this is going to ring true for you well mark when you shared with me that that person reached out to you and told you that you they changed that you changed their life that 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 statement really resonated with me because um, when that does happen to me, it really moves me. And the uh, I remember I was in my uh, my doctor's office, my ENT, who said who said I happened to save my life, Doctor Sugarman. If you ever need a good ENT in Los Angeles, he's uh, he's uh, a number one. So I was walking out of the you know, doctor office that I'm in. And uh, you know, those cubicles they put you in. And I run into this little old man and I looked down and I said, shit, you're Mick Jagger. <laughs> and I said, dang, you're old and short. <laughs> so I didn't say that, right? But I thought it, right? I mean, it's Mick Jagger, right? <laughs> how often do you see Mick Jagger? And and in that instant, you know how things just run through your head like in like a bunch of stuff. And one of the things that ran through my head is, why does this little old man get up on stage 20, 50 times a year and do his dance? What does he do that for? And I knew instantly why, because it's why I do what I do, because I dig powering others. That's how I grow. And it, it really, the whole reason I was seeing the ENT is because I had a head tumor and almost died when I was 41. And, and through the process of healing, I did some spiritual work. And through that spiritual work, I came to the conclusion that I'm here for the short period of time on my on this planet to grow my soul. And I and I grow my soul the best by helping other people grow theirs, rinse and repeat. And so when we talk about being momentum machines for others, uh, I find that's really the essential way that I grow is by by doing that. And so when um, when I hear people say that I've changed their lives. That's everything to me. And I think it's why I build the relationship tools that I do, because I think relationships power people's dreams. And I think if you could power millions of people to achieve the relationships that enable them to achieve their dreams, which I hope involve helping other people achieve their dreams, then my life is complete. And so this, uh, this section means a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope I hope people listening in today, I hope, you know, I hope you will take a look at the book. And like I said, when you get to the last chapter, you're you're gonna be in for a big surprise. <laughs> and uh, and I also guarantee you 
when you read this book, you'll never see the world the same way again. I've had that feedback from a lot of people that you'll begin to see these patterns of momentum when you meet others and you hear the founder story of other companies. You'll start to hear, ah, that was their initial spark. They pursued that idea. Oh, that was the seam that was happening. Oh, that's how they built awareness. Now, yeah, and you'll start to see this, that this is how momentum builds in our world. So that is really uh, the end of the, the big five uh, ideas, some, some of the takeaways um, that have been mentioned to me about the book. So I will end my, uh, my slide sharing here. And uh, I think we can open it up. Maybe there are some questions. I haven't been looking at the chat, but we let can just uh, chat for a few more minutes or open grab, it up to questions. Let me just grab the screen. Let me know when you can see my screen. Yeah. Okay. So we are, we're going to give away some books before we do some Oh, cool. And while we're doing the, the, this part, I just like to mention if you have questions, now's the time to enter them in the Q&A uh, section. Um, so if you email marketing at nimble.com, we're going to randomly select five of you to get Mark's book. Uh, and uh, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, I, by the way, I don't know if you know it, Mark, but Rocket Man was one of my favorite movies. <laughs> <laughs> love that movie. It's like good old fashioned fun. Oh, the love you mean the, the, the was it the Rocketeer? Yeah, the Rocketeer. Yeah. Rocketeer. Yeah. This was definitely inspired by the Rocketeer. I kind of had that in mind. Or you know, maybe it even hints at the Mandalorian a little bit. Yeah, and actually, John Favreau lives right behind me over there. I could uh, yell out my window wow. and say hi to John. Uh, he's uh, he's he's done some great things with his life. Okay. So uh, be sure to do that, put the questions in the Q&A box. And uh, for those of you who haven't tried Nimble yet, uh, go ahead and uh, sign up if you like what you see. There's a code for getting 40% off your first three months for new customers. Use the code John40. Um, and with that, let's get to some uh, q and I'm just going to see if I could pull up the Q&A um, uh, section and see if we have any questions. Uh, there's one. Uh, Cynthia says she has an idea and wants to start a new book. I've never written a book. Where do I start? Mark, that's a softball over the home plate there. <laughs> well, uh, so I think it's really important. Uh, if you've got an idea for a book, it's got to be, you have to be all in. Uh, a book is a tremendous amount of work, commitment, and it's also the biggest personal risk you can take for your brand. It's not like a blog post or a tweet where you can take it back and say, oh, didn't really mean that. When you write a book, it's part of your legacy and you put everything on the line and you can't take it back. So it's a big commitment, it's a lot of work, and it's a big risk. My process is, I, I only write a book when I see a problem that is that I just don't know the answer to. And my my friends and my colleagues and my students are, are suffering with something. In this case, for cumulative advantage, it was like, we're being buried. We're working as hard as we can. How do how can we be heard? We're we're creating you know epic content and we're doing SEO and we're just not you know, getting to the next level. And so part of the answer, at least I think, is momentum. So I, I create an outline. And then for about a year, I do research. And I and I just pay attention to the world. I might see an article, a research, a podcast. And, and, I, cre and I put it in a file for each chapter of the book. And then when it's time to write the book, I pull out the file and I have all the research, all the ideas ready to go. And over a period of a couple months, I, I, I write the book normally. It took me a lot longer. This is one of my shorter books, actually. And it took me the longest time to write because it was just, I had so much personal angst in it. Looks like we have a few other questions. And, and Mark, I think it was different for you, right? I think most of your other books were really focused on social and marketing. And this was really focused on, on the soul, uh, really. 
on your yeah, life? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, my friend, I think, I don't know if you know Jeff, Jeff Bullis or not. He's my friend down in Australia, a great marketing professional. He read this book the other day and he said, he said, Mark, he said, this this is a great marketing book. It's a great business book, but it's also a book on how to be a better human being. Yeah. And that meant that meant a lot. That meant a lot to me. Especially uh, he's an amazing human being who I'm lucky enough is, to have taken a walk But really, the- this this oh. book is part of a trajectory for me. You know, I wrote the first book on influence marketing when I back in 2012, when I recognized the power is shifting in our world from ad agencies and media companies to us because we can have a voice. Okay, we have a voice and I was right. And every all these voices started coming out. All of a sudden the world was overwhelmed with content. How do you crack through? Wrote the content code. How does a person stand out? Wrote known. What's the implications for marketing strategy? Wrote the marketing rebellion and now momentum. So it really does sort of have a path my books show like a continuum in my thinking. Um, it is different, but it's it's related. Mark, I have a question for you. Um, one of the things that you talked about that inspired you to write the book is that conversation you had about cumulative inequality. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I looked that up and saw that it was related to something called the Matthew effect. Right. And uh, and and this quote from Matthew, it really got me. Uh, For to everyone who has, will be given more, and he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Yeah. And, uh, and, and go, I, I want you to talk about. What is the cumulative advantage? How does it reflect on the cumulative inequality and the Matthew effect? And I think in some respects that this is that uh, that narrative that is in all of our heads that keeps us all in our places and that you're basically yeah. trying to break that ceiling. I, I think you're right in many respects. So the, the Matthew effect was a, it was a famous paper that was written in 1968 by a guy named Robert Merton. Robert Merton was a was an immigrant. He he was a, a little boy when his family came to the they were in the slums. There he is. He, he he landed in the slums of South Philadelphia, and his family was so poor he couldn't go to school. He had to work with his father's business to try to make ends meet. But every night, even when he was five years old, he would walk from the slums to the Carnegie Library, and he would read all night. And the librarian sort of adopted him. And he would he would pass these beautiful mansions, and he wondered, these people who are rich, they just seem to get richer. And look at us. We can't do anything right. We just keep getting poor. And then against all odds, he got a scholarship to Temple University. And against all odds, he got a scholarship, he got a PhD at Harvard. And against all odds, he became a professor at Columbia. And a student said, it's not fair. We do all the work and these professors get all the credit. They put their names on the paper and they get more money and more funding and more resources and bigger offices. And we just stay here. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And Robert Merton said, I know. Now, how do I prove it? So he wrote this paper based on a study of Nobel Prize winners. And what he showed is that if you get this initial advantage and you play your cards right, that momentum will build forever and you will separate yourself from your competition. And what I did in this book for the first time is figure out how all this academic research really applies to our lives and our and our businesses. I love it. I love it. I I uh I really think that what you're doing is you're helping to break the uh, the narrative. Uh, here's uh, a comment from Jamie. I loved your comment about South Out Books being elitist. What are some other ways we can become momentum machines for others that may not have the resources to get self-help or even be aware that there is a better life out there for them? This got me inspired. Yeah, well, actually, uh, I have some very specific ideas about that, and at the at the 
you know, my call to action at the end of the book is is that now that we realize that momentum begins with these small steps, random steps, you don't have to be rich. John wasn't rich when he saw his first computer. I wasn't rich when I started my you know, career. It was some random thing that charged us up. It was an idea. It was a revelation. Maybe it was encouragement from others. And guess what? That's something all of us can do. That's something all of us can do. And especially when it comes to young people. So I've actually got a place on my website with vetted agencies that are dedicated to creating momentum for young people. And I encourage everyone to take a look at this, get involved. I know everyone's busy, but just look at some of the ideas of how we might create sparks for kids. That's the future. That's our hope. We have to create momentum for our children. Amen. And and I have an idea for you, Jamie. If you're looking for ways to become momentum mach machines for others that don't have the resources to get self-help or aren't aware there's a better life out there for them, my recommendation is to give you knowledge away on a daily basis. And if you don't have enough knowledge to give it away, then give away the knowledge of people that inspire and, re and resonate and, and educate you, people that resonate with you. And if you give knowledge away on a daily basis about how people can be, become better, smarter, faster, then you will start to become a momentum machine for others. I recommend that you Google Vala Ashfar. Vala used to be a, uh, a customer service rep at, uh, at a East Coast technology company. Uh, and he started to use social media to build his brand and eventually he built his brand so much that that company got bought by another company. And eventually his brand was so big that he became the chief digital evangelist for Salesforce. And all Valid does on a daily basis is give knowledge away. Much of it is inspirational and educational. And he now has what, uh, 538,000 followers. And he's a source of light and love for, for millions of people. And so that's my recommendation about how you can help other people grow is sell them a better version of themselves on a daily basis. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Vivica, I'm currently launching my women social business networking site. I retained a digital marketing specialist. What would you recommend as a strategy for going up against bigger platforms, Mark? Well, it's it's hard to give specific advice without really knowing um, all the factors. But you know, I it, it, you you have to look for that seam, right? What's the fracture in the status quo that makes you special? The fracture might be that the people on those big platforms, their needs aren't being met in some way. Maybe it's too impersonal. Maybe they want to go a different way. So you've got to find where you fit. You've got to zig where the other ones are zagging. They're just going, going, going. you got to find a way to be different in a meaningful way. You've got to find what are the unmet or underserved needs of the people on these bigger platforms. And I can solve this problem in a unique way. And if you can solve that puzzle, you're on your way. You, you know, Mark, I think that you're spot on with that. I think what you're also sort of saying in the same way is find your unique niche and serve that. Many companies, let's say associations to support women, might be totally horizontal. Yeah. Maybe you want to yeah. a niche, right? And so if right. you already have a sort of a, maybe it's it's younger people or older people or it's uh, people, alternative people or whatever it is, that you could find a niche. A friend of mine started something called Girls Club, and she's helping to support young girls who are interested in becoming leaders in sales and marketing. And um, and so that's a niche. And so, and then the other thing is, Mark, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Would you do a small window coaching session with Vivica and uh, and maybe collaborate with her a little bit if she reached out to you? Sure. Okay. Because I know that you are, uh, a big hearted guy like that. Uh, Victoria asks, what's, and this is gonna be the final question, I think, because we're over the top of the hour. 
uh, what's the best way you have found to grow your relationships every day uh, to have opportunities to give to others? Here's what I do, really, especially during the pandemic. Uh, when I see people on, you, you know, when I see people who are posting something and they're suffering, something's wrong. Maybe they're saying, I'm down, I'm in a funk. Uh, I call them up. And, um, you know, it's it's not really like I'm building a relationship where I expect something back. But I mean, what I'm trying to do right now is I always look at how can I apply my skills, my core competencies to help people where they are right now. And I'm a good listener. And so sometimes people just need to listen. They need someone to listen. And so I just seek people out who are who are suffering and just say, look, do you need somebody to talk to? Or I just call them up and and it almost always helps. So that's that's sort of how I'm approaching it right now. And there's lots of opportunity. <laughs> and 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 my tip for uh Gaining visibility with people that you can help grow on a daily basis relates back to what I said before, is every one of us is passionate about something or things. And it's the things that you're passionate about that you spend your time doing every morning when you get on your computer. I happen to be interested in social sales and marketing and, of course, astronomy and history and other things. And what I do on a daily basis, I just share that content, uh, not just my business passions, but also my personal passions, because I think that people connect on the five Fs of life, family, friend, food, fun and fellowship, and that you should share what you're passionate about beyond the business side so people connect to your softer sides. But when I share that content, I then listen and engage with those people in order to build a connection. And I like to take those connections from the soft connections into a firmer place like email calendar and face-to-face. -face. And when I do that face-to-face, -face, I don't just jump into how great I am or my products are. I do my homework, I get to know that person, and then I ask some open questions and I just shut up and listen. Because if you listen to others, they will tell you who they are and how you might help them grow. And uh, and then if you just rinse and repeat that, and then don't forget to follow up with people that you've already connected with uh, to stay connected with them, because most relationship gas fuel to build a relationship gets spent in the beginning, like a car getting zero to 60 or a rocket getting into orbit. Most of that fuel is spent to get to speed, not to maintain speed. So don't forget when you're building relationships to go out and nurture and maintain those relationships as well. And if you do that, then the universe will present you with an unlimited amount of people that you can help grow uh, on a daily basis. And by doing that, that is how you will grow in life. Mark, That's do you have any questions? That is just a, I couldn't say anything better to end this webinar. <laughs> That's a beautiful right. way to end things. And thanks to everyone for listening today. I never ever take uh, you for granted spending time with me and my ideas. So thank you for being here today. I do hope that you'll check out uh, the new book. Thanks, John, for the opportunity thank and thanks for all your support. Thank you, Nimble Team, for supporting us in the background. Thank you, everybody who took their valuable time to uh, come and join us today. Uh, I wish you an amazing uh, rest of the day and the week, the year, and your life. Take care.